Greetings, everybody. Welcome to the first show of 2020. This is January 8th, and you are on free webinar Wednesdays. This is Eric Cook with WSI Digital, where we work with businesses and organizations and helping them better understand and leverage the power of the internet as a strategic business tool. You can learn more about us on our, within the next couple of weeks, brand new website over at poweredbywsi.com. Today's show and all shows here at Free Webinar Wednesdays are recorded and made available at freewebinarwednesdays.com. So you're encouraged to stop by and check out past shows, share it with friends and colleagues, and uh, let us know what you think. We'd love to hear from you. We also very much enjoy the live format, although sometimes uh, you're going to hear me trip on my tongue because that's just the way that things happen when you go live. But that's the joy of a live show. And the other advantage is those of you that are attending live can interact with us. And today's conversation around SEO and social media, building search and visibility for your business, I suspect is gonna generate quite a few questions and we would love to have those. So please find your chat function in the control panel, which is likely floating over on the right-hand side of your screen and let us know what you think. We've had a little bit of uh, commentary already this morning and uh, certainly would love to have more of that as the show evolves. So this is a continuation of a series of shows that are dedicated to the third edition of WSI's book called Digital Minds. And um, we've had prior shows, if you scroll down through, talking about video and competitor analysis. We've got some more scheduled for later in the year as well. And the goal is to get through all 12 chapters with some really good deep dive information to help our audience really understand key components and elements of a digital marketing strategy, all brought to you, um, I'm gonna say this and it's gonna sound really biased, but it is, the awesome folks at WSI, because as you all well know, I'm part of the WSI ecosystem and while I consider it employment and a job, I think as Mark can attest to, it's really a family and uh, we were talking in the pre-show about our annual convention and the fact that I wasn't able to be there and um, not just because of all the great learning that I missed, but seeing folks like Mark and others in person um, is just really great because I do consider all of these folks, guys and gals, uh, family to me and uh, certainly have been beneficial to our success here as an agency and hopefully we give back a little bit to those folks as well. So with that long-winded kind of intro, sappy, why I love WSI uh, blurb, um, I'm excited Mark Jameson is joining us from Ottawa. You might hear a little bit of a Canadian tinge, but that's okay. Um, we love our Canadian friends and all the others that join us from around the world. Um, but he's one of the authors in the third book, like myself. He wrote a really awesome chapter on SEO and social media, which are a couple of things that I absolutely love. And uh, him and his wife have been part of the network. I'm not exactly sure, but as soon as I flip the magic button, I'm going to ask you to introduce the audience to you, talk a little bit about uh, where you came from and kind of how you run your business, just to give some perspective. And then we'll jump into the content and you can share with us the information from your slides and what you wrote about in your chapter. And we'll just kind of talk for the next hour. So Mark, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Hey, it's a pleasure, Eric, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so, so go ahead. So I was going to say, who is Mark Jamison? Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background. Uh, obviously, you're a digital consultant in the WSI world, but when you're not on the internet working on stuff, what do you like to do? I heard skiing is one of those when there's enough snow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah. Ah, well, first and foremost, I'm a uh, I'm a father of two beautiful little girls, uh, 13 and 11, and uh, we're a big family of skiers. So as I was uh, telling you earlier in the show, we, uh, you know, as much as everybody hopes for mild winters and no snow, I, you know, we, we kind of think the opposite here, and we're hoping for uh, big dumps and get out up on the hills. So that's our uh, that's our that's our winter, you know, in a nutshell. It's uh, you know weekends out skiing. But uh, besides that, you know, I love what I do and, you know, we put a lot of hours into this business. As uh, you mentioned, my wife also works here uh, with the agency and uh, we're co-owners and have a few employees here in-house as well. And uh, yeah, we're just, we're busy, 
busy, busy, busy trying to generate leads and sales for our clients using the internet, as you said. Absolutely. And I might add award-winning consultants. Um, WSI now is the proud owner uh, within our network of uh, 100 web marketing awards through the Web Marketing Association. And um, I don't remember how many you guys have taken home, yeah, but I know, have, uh, uh, two, I I know it's more than one. It yeah, more so than that's one. awesome. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Which is what I've got. So you got me beat by one. I got I got to work on that for next year. But, uh-huh. uh, yeah, super proud of that. And uh, you guys do really, really good work. So, um, so, so good job there. So uh, your we're, chapter we're – Yeah. So um, your chapter on social media, SEO, kind of being found, um, what inspired you to take on this topic as we were selecting authors and uh, and why did you choose this as, you know, what you wanted to write 2000 words about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know what? It's uh, I absolutely love search engine optimization when we uh, when we began the began the business here about six years ago. You know, SEO was. uh, just one of those things that we really took seriously and you know not just for our clients but even for ourselves as an agency and uh you know to this day i would probably say over 60 percent of the leads that we generate here through our agency come in through come in through the internet come in through search so we we absolutely love the whole concept behind seo um you know we just we can't get enough of it and it's probably about 80 percent of our business and we've just had immense success uh with client campaigns just really you know, pushing their rankings, drawing, you know, massive amounts of traffic to our clients' websites, which at the end of the day just translates into great income. So, you know, this is why I really chose the chapter. But, you know, I think what uh, what really keeps me going with it is, you know, like anything digital, you know, we like to joke around with our clients. I know 90% of what I need to know to run a successful campaign today, but by next week, I know 60 you know, it's just changing so fast. And, you know, just, just, the, That's for sure. just the amount of yeah, and just staying educated and staying on top of the the technologies and the strategies and, you know, how people search for products and services. I just find it absolutely intriguing. And, uh, you know, we just love it. And we have a team here in-house that just absolutely loves SEO. And, you know, it's what we do 80% of the time. Very cool. Well, let's get into some of your slides. I know uh, I got a sneak peek at those before the show, and there's some really good info in here. And uh, I want to make sure. We get plenty of time to share all that and uh, have some conversations. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, and you know, coming into this, I think it's uh, you know a few things that I always you know like to you know educate you know my my customers a little bit on SEO, and I think we do need to understand um, the past in order to really be able to capitalize on the future. And you know, when it comes to Google, when it comes to SEO, I think you know really from the beginning. You know, Google's only ever wanted to do one thing, and it's really serve up the most relevant search to somebody's query. You know, and in the early days, obviously, you know, we, we got a lot of searches that might have been as relevant as we would have liked to. But I think when it comes to today, Google's really perfected its algorithm, and it's trying hard, you know, to really be able to serve up the most relevant searches. You know, and, and, and for us, I, I just find it absolutely interesting. You know, a quick history lesson here, when we look back at 2011, um really you know we we've all heard of the google zoo for anybody who's been in seo you know i don't want to spend a lot of time on this because you know we've we've talked about this for years but you know google coined these uh massive algorithm changes and really named them after cute little zoo animals maybe just to you know not make the impact so you know so detrimental but really really did is it it really shook up the seo environment and you know in 2011 2012 and 2013 Google came out with some massive algorithm changes really to eliminate anything that had to do with black hat SEO. Um, And really its concept was really to allow content to be everything. And and that really hasn't changed today. Content in 2013, 2013, sorry, became absolutely everything. Without great content, you just cannot rank, you know? And and I love this because it, it just means that it really evens the playing field out there for a lot of business, whether you're a small business, whether you're a large business, obviously, and I understand the financial concepts that larger businesses obviously have bigger marketing budgets, but we've had immense success locally with smaller companies with smaller budgets only because Google has done a good job at really leveling the playing field here for everybody to get opportunities to rank. And again, coming back to one of the reasons why I absolutely love search engine optimization, because you know we all have a chance. 
And, you know, and with that said, you know, I think, you know, when we come back to some of what Google has done recently, and I know, Eric, you know, we, uh, this will tie into a lot of what you tend to do and what you tend to work with, but coming into 2017, 2018, I really feel that Google shook it up immensely when it started looking at um, really what it wanted to um, attack in terms of search engine optimization, meaning that, you know, the type of sites that Google wants to rank now, you know, what you need to do to be able to rank, and it's more than just links, and it's more than just on-page optimization. Um, Google came out with a concept, and this concept's been around really since 2015, but we've now heard of this, this acronym called EAT, which really touches on expertise, authority, and trust. Right. And I know, Eric, for you, this is something that, you know, you've been working very strongly with over the last little while. But, you know, Google is now really coming out and saying, listen, sites need to have a certain amount of expertise. They need to have a certain amount of authority and they need to have a certain amount of, of trust in order for you to rank well in search engines. And what really happened with that is it really got pushed to certain types of websites. And uh, this algorithm change was actually initially uh, coined the medic update because it really shook the field of the medical industry. And then it tied into sites that fall under the your money, your life umbrella, which is YMYL, uh, which really started looking at um, sites that can really affect the happiness of an individual like financial health sites. And, you know, and Google really started looking at these and saying, listen, unless you are really generating a massive amount of expertise, authority and trust, we simply will not rank your websites for that. And Almost like a public service, Google's trying to take the extra initiative. And I know you've got some additional slides here that talk about it, but, you know, not that we call it fake news, but no. because money is so sensitive and your health is so sensitive, in particular those two, and, and often I've even said as a banker, when somebody comes into you as a banker, and you get them to give you all of their information with the exception of going to the doctor, you're probably no, uh, you're as vulnerable as you're ever going to be. They, they see your credit, they see your debt, they see your bad payments, they see how much money you have in the bank. Mm -hmm. And so taking that into consideration, and we've been talking, because we do a lot of work with banks for anybody that isn't familiar with Free Webinar Wednesdays and our focus, but we've always talked about establishing credibility, subject matter expertise, leveraging social. We're trying to get our banks to think about writing content and pushing that out to blogs, sure. but making sure the world knows that you really are a professional in those industries. And I think we're gonna see some trickle down into other industries as well, whether it's heating and cooling or landscape or construction, that eventually that expertise is also going to make a big difference as the algorithm continues to get better and more intelligent because like you said at the beginning, Google just wants to give you the absolute best information for the search that you've entered. And the more it can quantify who that expert is, the better the results are gonna be and the happier you're gonna be with the, with the Google experience. No, and absolutely, Eric. I think, you know, you nailed it there. I think right now, you know, we can see a lot of the uh, financial sites, the medical sites, the legal sites, you know, anything that has to do with shopping or transactions you know, adoption agencies or really anything that has to do with personal safety really being affected by this algorithm update. You know, again, Google just wants to ensure that, you know, if a website can seriously affect your well-being or the safety of a person, it just wants to ensure that it is serving up the most relevant queries to that search. But you said it, um, at the end of the day, this is going to apply really to just about any website down the road, whether you are plumbing, heating and cooling, whether you sell, you know, widgets or gadgets, you know, at the end of the day, Google will flow this out to most of the websites. But, you know, I think really when it comes to um, anything to do with Google's algorithm, especially what we're seeing right now in uh, 2018 coming into 2019. And I always find this really interesting, Eric, you know, when we talk to our clients, when we uh, are out, you know, discussing SEO with, with our customers, one of the things that we hear so often is simply this, why does Google make it so hard for us to rank, you know? And I think one of the big misconceptions here, and one of the things that a lot of people don't even realize is that when you do an internet search, when you open up Google or you open up Bing and you go ahead and you enter that query into, the, into that search bar, you're not actually searching the internet. You're actually searching that search engine's index of the internet, that information that is really gathered into their database. 
you know, and, and at the end of the day, you know, when you start looking at that concept and saying, okay, you know, this is Google's database of the internet, and it simply wants to ensure that when it serves up a result, it's the right one. And, and what I love about this is Google actually put it out there. Uh, back in 2015, they actually published a quality evaluator guidelines, really, that restates out exactly what does Google consider to be quality sites and really how is that algorithm worked. And we came over talking about the, um, the EAT algorithm right now. And what I find really interesting, and I don't know if you were aware of this, but EAT is actually mentioned 186 times in Google's quality evaluated guideline. So as SEOs, you know, we need to be looking at this and we need to be taking it seriously and looking exactly at what Google is saying with us. Very good point. For folks that aren't familiar with the quality evaluator guidelines, you want to give just a little bit of a background on what that document is and um, is it publicly available? Is that their secret sauce? Um, maybe shed some light on that. Yeah, this is the beauty about it. It is publicly available and it's not their secret sauce. It's, it's out there for you to read. I believe it's about 150, 160 page guide that really outlines, you know, what Google is going to be considering as, you know, a, you know, as authoritative and as trustworthy sites and really what it looks at for you to be ranking things that, you know, and, and, and I'm going to go back a little bit with this and really kind of give everybody here who's listening a sense of, you know, how Google's algorithm works a little bit and look at a bit of the human factor when it comes to this guide. Um, you know, it, there's a rumor that goes around that there's, you know, and I, I believe it to be true, there's probably about 10,000 10, people out there at Google whose jobs every day are to go out and look at websites, right? So they'll do search terms and they'll look at those top three websites. Um, you know, these, these technicians more or less go on and they look at these sites and they say, does this site have authority? Does it promote trustworthiness? Is, you know, does it meet, you know, the, the factors that we've actually listed in this guideline? Now, just because maybe a site that does rank in the top three uh, doesn't meet all these guidelines doesn't mean that it's going to drop tomorrow. But, you know, these people then take this information and give it back to Google's web span team and their, and their algorithm guys. And they, this is what they use day in and day out to be tweaking this algorithm. So I find it really interesting that the human factor to the algorithm is there as well as, you know, the robotic side of it that's actually indexing these websites. So definitely, um, you know, you need to read this guideline. It's there, it's available to the public. Um, again, it's not a small guide, but the information is definitely there if you know how to dissect it. Excellent. And with that said, Eric, you know, I think, you know, some of the things that a lot of people are asking us right now is, you know, when it comes to um, the EAT algorithm, you know, what are some of the things that we need to be looking at today to really ensure that our site ranks well? And these are some of the top things within the guideline that you can look at that really Google takes very seriously. And number one, it's the reputation of a website, you know, and I think that speaks for itself. Google is really looking at the reputation of your site. You know, what are people saying about it? Um, you know, user content, you know, um, if there are forums out there that are stating that, you know, this website doesn't refund or they're doing bad work or there's reviews all over the place that are really bashing that reputation, then there's a good chance that Google will not rank you for that site. Um, you know, and I think this is something that we've known for a long time. Uh, one of the big things as well is, you know, sneaky redirects, right? If, uh, you know, you're, you know, getting people to land on your website in order to try to get them to transact into something else. Again, these are areas that Google is looking at to saying, hey, this is going against what we consider to be quality, um, what we consider to be authority and trust, and basically is driving these sites down the ranks. Um, any types of black hat tactics like keyword stuff, and I think today those are just done. So um, this makes sense. Copy content, right? Google is looking at this and saying, listen, this is not original content. There's no authority to this content. Um, again, we're not going to rank you for that. Uh, we live in a mobile age. You know, if you're, you're not mobile friendly today, then again, uh, your chances of ranking are probably not going to do too well. Um, overly soliciting personal information is actually something else that Google is looking at right now. So if you're phishing or trying to get too much information, um, you do risk the chance of, uh, you know, falling down the ranks as well. And sites with heavy monetization. So basically sites that just publish content that, you know, you pay for. 
you know, and at the end of the day, if, uh, you know, sites that just basically take ads, you know, Google is not ranking them where they used to be. And uh, these sites will drop in the searches as for the simple reason that Google just wants to serve up information that they know is going to uh, affect the people who are searching properly. So one of the things that I'll often get asked, and I'm sure you do as well, is mm -hmm. how do I, um, well, for lack of a better way of saying it, how do I beat the algorithm? How do I know what Google wants and how do I serve the algorithm? And I think what you'll probably say, you know, Google, I don't know if it's their mantra anymore. It used to be their, like their mission statement was do no evil or do no harm, something like that. But for folks that want to chase the algorithm and figure out what Google wants versus doing the right thing. And as I read this list of items that you put together, in reality, that's just being a good business. You want Absolutely. to have a good reputation. You don't want to be doing sneaky stuff or, you know, shady things behind the curtains mm -hmm. that trick people into doing things. And, you know, the days of putting white text on a white background because you think you can trick a keyword engine are long mm -hmm. gone. Um, so, so having an, I guess my question is having an understanding of the guidelines and the algorithm, mm -hmm. how important is that versus just focusing on quote, doing the right thing? And can you get marred down with all this algorithmic stuff? And at the end of the day, if you're just a good person doing what you should be doing, is that going to be enough to, to get you down the road for successful SEO? I don't think so, personally. Um, you know, I, I think we need to understand that the days of ranking fast are done. Um, you know, it, it's not easy to get to those coveted spots in Google. Um, just because you have a website and you do good work, you know, it doesn't mean that Google's going to just magically, you know, allow you to come in in those top five positions. You know, it, it's a competitive sphere. Yep. You know, I think everybody, you know, I don't think there's a business out there that isn't competitive, right? And, you know, Google's, you know, Google comes right out. And again, I, I got to come back to what I said, you know, this is Google's database and Google has certain uh, objectives that it wants you to follow in order to rank. You know, we, we do have to play a little bit by their rules, but the big one, you know, but I will say this, you know, we can say, you know, we, you know, you can be a great business and create a website and keep it static for five to seven years. And it doesn't mean you're a bad person or a bad business person, but it certainly does mean that your site probably will not rank well in the search engines. You know, Google simply comes out and says, you need to be updating this content. You need to be creating quality content. You know, this content needs to be socialized. It needs to be shared. Um, you know, you still need backlinks. You know, we're looking to see if there's any other authoritative companies out there that are mentioning you on their sites. You know, we're talking about links now coming back. So, you know, I, I really don't think that there is any real way that anybody can just rank now by creating a good website, doing good on-page optimization. Um, you know, the really glory, the, you know, the glory and the guts to anything SEO is, is in the content afterwards. It's in really creating information and answering questions that people want answers to. You know, and this is going to segue a little bit into, you know, what we're going to be talking about next is, you know, some of the changes that Google has actually made um, you know, in the last year and a half, some of the new things that we're seeing in search engines like feature snippets, et cetera, right? And, you know, it's, uh, I really wish I could say, Eric, yeah, just be a good business person, have a good reputation and create a solid website and you're probably going to rank. But, you know, the answer to that is absolutely not. There you go. Cool. In my, in my humble opinion. <laughs> As an award-winning internet digital web consultant. I think it's a little bit more than humble, but I'll, uh, I'll accept it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and at the end of the day, listen, I'm not coming to come out here and say that, you know, every business owner out there needs to go and drop thousands of thousands of dollars on search engine optimization. There's certainly some things that you can do yourself. Um, again, monitor your reputation, ensure that you're doing good work, get those reviews, you know, create a website that's user friendly, create a website that's mobile friendly. Um, you know, again, create great content that answers questions. It's definitely going to give you some opportunities and it's, you know, it, it's something, it's a foundation. Um, but at the end of the day, there's uh, unfortunately a little bit more to it than that if uh, you do really want to hit those coveted top three, top five spots.
Absolutely. Cool. Good stuff. Yeah. I love it. And, uh, you know, kind of what we're saying here and, you know, segueing into um, some of the things that really I've noticed and uh, we've paid some, uh, some high attention to you in the last year and a half. And uh, really it's what's happening in the search engine itself. And, uh, you know, I think for a lot of SEOs out there, we all recognize this face. But uh, one of the new terms that we've heard out there in the last uh, year and a half is what we're now calling on SERP SEO or even position zeros uh, when it comes to search engine optimization. And, and we're now talking about really what we call on SERP SEO or for those who don't know the term SERP, search engine results pages. Um, really, I find this so interesting is what Google has done uh, in the last year and a half when it comes to uh, what they are now serving up in the search engines. And, you know, this is really where I would like to put a little bit of focus because it's a big part of the, uh, of the chapter that I wrote here for the Digital Minds books is really uh, what is going on in the search engines and also why is this happening. And it's a lot has to do with the new technologies that we're using to actually search for queries. So with that, um, our good friend Rand Fishkin here, I think a lot of people remember as the, uh, the main brain behind Moz, but uh, about a year and a half ago, he wrote this and he just simply said that on SERP SEO, in my opinion, is really gonna be the big trend that is gonna change in our field. Uh, a few years from now, we can see the vast majority of searches ending on Google's results right here on the results page. And uh, you know, a lot of people are not familiar with snippets maybe asking, what is that? What does that mean? It simply means that Google is now answering questions to our queries directly in the search engine without actually having to click back through somebody's website. And uh, I don't, I, I think for SEOs out there, Eric, and I don't know if you agree or not, but really there's, that, that's a pretty scary concept. Absolutely. And, you know, even the, there's an element that I don't see here about uh, an instant answer where you'll actually get content pulled directly off of a website and inserted right above the rich snippets and it'll give you credit so it'll say brought to you by wsi or xyz bank or whoever and there's a conversation that you have to have with you know the fact that somebody probably isn't going to come back to your website you're going to be the one to answer the question if google selects your content as being the best information but the amount of traffic that you drive back to your website might actually decrease but your visibility your web presence may increase and that's a real difficult thing for people to understand because we've taught them that we want to drive traffic back to their website and google's changing the rules of the game on us no, absolutely. And, you know, and I think it's uh, it's really scared some of the SEOs out there who got to report this back to the client. You know, a lot of times we, you know, we, we report back to our clients and we look at the massive amounts of traffic that we brought back and this traffic is translating to leads and we can easily track this and, you know, really scale it down to saying, hey, you know, this came here, this resulted in this. And, you know, at the end of the day, it resulted in a phone call or a form fill. But now we're getting these questions answered directly right here in the, what we've now called featured snippets. And uh, Google is just really just giving us the answers in forms of, you know, Q&As. So how do we, uh, how do we work around this? You know, and I think this is a big part of what I've covered in the book here today is, you know, and it's funny, even coming back to the EAT algorithm, um, I believe it was uh, Marie Haynes that I was watching not too long ago talking about that you know, even with this, the authority and the trustworthiness, snippets play a big factor in this. We need to now be answering questions that the searchers are asking uh, to the devices that they're asking questions to. And this plays a really big part now into the mobile and voice search. I think snippets really uh, came to light because of what is happening right now with uh, you know, the artificial intelligence devices that we now have in our homes, the Google Homes and the Alexas. Uh, we are simply not typing questions into the search box anymore. We're actually asking questions to these devices. And uh, a lot of the times these questions are being read out to us in the form of feature snippets. Yep, absolutely. And, and really it's, uh, it, it, it's interesting to me. Um, I, I love the fact that, um, you know, we can really now start looking at the technologies and how, how the technology is really reshaping how we are receiving the information. 
And I think as SEOs and as agencies who perform SEO, we really need to be on top of this. Um, I don't think there's anything more important right now than on SERP optimization when it comes to SEO. Um, I think every SEO out there should be doing a great job at creating massive amounts of content that answer your searches questions right now. And, you know, we've done well. We've, you know, we have a handful of customers here that we work with pretty closely and we've taken this concept to heart and we're generating massive amounts of snippets for our clients. And, you know, we can definitely see uh, what it's translating into uh, leads for our clients. So it, it, it's been good. Quick question for you as it relates to the snippets. Is there an easy way, because I suspect that information is not showing up in Google Analytics or any, no. is, there, is there tracking or how do you determine when featured snippets with your information as a business are being presented in Google if traffic isn't being generated mm -hmm. and Google Analytics isn't seeing it. Maybe talk a little sure. bit about that. That's probably a question folks yeah. listening might have. Yeah, absolutely. There is some, you know, we use SEM Rush and it does have a, uh, uh, you know, it's in beta right now, but it does have, a, you know, an option that does go out and searches for snippets for you. But honestly, I'm, I, I haven't seen it really been all that successful at this point. But I think what's really worked for us here is, you know, we we keep track of the questions that we are trying to answer. Obviously, you know, we're not answering questions that we know do not have search volume for. So with that said, if, uh, you know, if we were working with a client that, uh, you know, is, you know, what are the best power tools to work with when it comes to wood, you know, if that does have search volume, we'll do a lot of manual searches internally when we're reporting and we'll try to find snippets for our clients. Um, see if they are coming up, et cetera. But definitely there is some software out there that can help you with it. Um, how reliable and how accurate is it at this point? It's, uh, I don't think it's quite there, but there's, there's definitely some progress that has been made with it. But the evolution is coming and tools are likely going to be able to help us evaluate that because when SEM Rush originally came out, I'm sure even the basics of what it does really well now today probably didn't work all that well while it got developed. So no, the absolutely. tracking and measurement of this will continue to improve. So don't feel like we're operating in a complete black box, but as it evolves, things will get better at figuring out how to measure the effectiveness. No, it absolutely will. And uh, like I said, it's, you know, the tools are there, they're, they're being built, uh, they do work. Um, have we seen them generate all the snippets? No. Um, we've definitely done a good job of doing a lot of manual searches and finding a little bit more than the tools have at this point, but uh, I would have to assume that would uh, that will change soon enough and uh, the tools should be able to scrape, uh, you know, at least a good portion of these snippets in time. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, one of the questions that, uh, you know, we've been, you know, getting a lot lately, you know, whether it's from you know, other, you know, other SEOs out there that are too sure how, you know, we can achieve these position zeros or these snippets. Um, you know, I think, again, it's uh, segueing into the technologies that are being used and really understanding why did Google start generating these snippets. And when it comes to devices like Google or Alexa, um, we are now asking search engines questions. We're not simply typing uh, short tail keywords as to, you know, power tools in my city, you know, we may be, you know, asking Google, hey, what are the best power tools for me to finish my basement with, right? So we were definitely changing the way that we're asking questions to search engines. So with that said, which is really one of the big reasons why these snippets are now becoming so important, but uh, there's some strategies that we can actually follow now to ensure that we are generating some snippets. And, you know, this is really what I put onto the slide and it's something that we touch on heavily in the book is how do we achieve these position zero snippets and uh, you know one of the first things that we need to understand is it all boils down and, and, and another thing I love about you know SEO is we can always we can take all these technologies today 2019 2020 and everything that we're doing and we can simply boil back down to some of the fundamentals it still starts with awesome keyword research right really understanding what are the questions that people are answering into the search engines and going out and finding that, ensuring that there's good search volume for it and answering those questions, you know. So we've been following, um, you know, and I know you've probably heard of this, uh, Eric, but we've been following this strategy that's been developed by HubSpot and it's really called the pillar cluster strategy where we will now go out and try to find maybe would it be eight, 10, 12 of the 
highest volume questions that people are asking on a certain topic and really answering them in about 40 to 80 words just to really try to get these snippets to get generated and then what we then do is we write you know what we call clusters is uh, we're writing these you know three to four hundred word blogs now on these uh, on these questions and linking them back to this pillar piece and we've had immense 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 success doing this for our clients and uh, this is one of the biggest reasons why we've had so much success generating these snippets here in the last year and a half. That's great. Absolutely, absolutely. So we've just been, uh, it really has been a, an immense year and you know, we're, we're glad to, to uh, be able to uh, keep it up with this. And I think that when it comes to OneSERP optimization, this is really gonna be the focus of our 2020 strategies and moving on. Anything to add on that, Eric? Um, no, I just, uh, uh, you're preaching to the choir here. So I know I just did a quick little time check and I uh, I can't remember exactly how many slides you have, but I know I tend to talk a lot and I just want to make sure we don't go over because we've oh, got no, an hour allocated. Yeah, so, uh, but some good stuff. So as it relates to those small little you know 40 to 80 words are you writing those and adding those to a website as something like an faq and yeah. you've got like an faq page and each of the questions has a, a subsection that answers that very distinctly and um you know because 40 to 80 words is a pretty short response on a blog post it is. So let me, you know, let me you know, look at this a little bit differently here. So we're, we're actually writing this as a blog piece. Um, you know, when you start getting 12 to, you know, 15 short, you know, questions and you're writing these these quick little answers to them, they, they tend to fill up the pages pretty quick. You know, obviously we'll load this up with some awesome imagery and some video, et cetera. And we will publish it as a blog, but I think where the real magic happens is in the after strategy is when we're creating um, the larger content to these questions so for example maybe we answered a question in 40 80 words but then we will write a cluster piece to that question which will really be elaborating on that in about three to four hundred words and linking it back to this pillar piece and what we started seeing is google actually pulling these quick 40 to 80 word snippets and into the feature snippets area and then basically having that link back to the blog and to the cluster. So, you know, the strategy is out there. HubSpot put it out. It's easy to Google. It's something that we've been using now for the last year. And, you know, I have to say it's just been working beautifully. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. So we, uh, and, uh, you know, and this is really what we wanted to tie in a little bit is, you know, as well in the chapter that we started talking about. And I know this is something that uh, you're always been very interested in, Eric, is the technologies now that really are initiating some of the changes that are happening in the SEO industry. And, you know, I think we have to look at voice as probably being one of the defining changes that is really going to revolutionize how we search for uh, just about anything on the Internet coming into the next few years. Uh, I believe it's been written now that by 2021, 60% of all searches will be voice-based. So, you know, I think now the technologies that we have, whether it's on our phones, whether it's on the devices that we have in our home, um, we really need to start answering these questions in terms of content if we really want to start being competitive. Absolutely. Yeah, we're, um, I've got a Google Home and I've got an Alexa, multiple devices sprinkled around the house and, mm -hmm. um, you know, while the amount of skills and other sorts of functions deployed in the Alexa environment certainly haven't lived up to what I think everybody thought, there's still a lot of searching that goes on and information that comes back when you're asking it questions that all has to come from somewhere. And we don't think of Alexa as a search engine, but in many ways it's doing exactly what Google's doing is we're asking it a question, it has a repository of data that it has access to and or has archived or indexed, and it's gonna give that information back, whether it's what's the weather forecast or driving directions or what's next to my calendar, but the convenience of that voice activation, even starting with Siri way, way back in the day, 
mm-hmm. um, just continues to evolve and is making the search a lot more rich because it's a lot easier to talk to your device and give it as much information as you want, as opposed to typing it on a keyboard for, you know, plumbers in Battle Creek, Michigan, you know, it's, um, find me a plumber that deals with, you know, septic systems. And that's a different search than it was a few years ago. And that yeah, absolutely is. And and again, it, it's, it's still coming back to what we're trying to preach here with our clients is that, you know, in order for you to really be able to capitalize on these technologies, um, it still boils back down to content. We need to be creating massive amounts of content that answer the questions that the searches are either typing into the search engines or now asking the search engines. And, uh, you know, and to me, I really do think that voice is really what's going to fuel SEO. Um, it's no longer going to be what we see on the screen. It's going to be what we're saying to it. And, uh, you know, and I find this absolutely, absolutely interesting. Yeah. I know I have a preference. If I'm going to respond to an email these days, I almost would rather get on my phone and respond via voice because voice recognition is so good. It's not SEO, but just the convenience of voice. And as I do that on email, that's just going to be a natural extension of search and anything else that I do from a technology perspective. So we all better be prepared. We need to be. Um, we need to be. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I know we're going to segue into some social media stuff as yeah. well. Um, but, you know, the lessons that these platforms are learning and, and extrapolate, and we talk about eat being focused on medical and finance and wealth Mm -hmm. but it's populating an engine driven by artificial intelligence that will ultimately extrapolate that expertise authority and trustworthiness down to the local plumber or the hairdresser or the dentist um which i guess would be medical so i probably (laughs) used the wrong example there but you know what i mean I, I know exactly what you mean. And, uh, you know, and again, when it comes to anything machine learning or AI, you know, definitely, you know, a little bit two different things. But, you know, Google is obviously, you know, it, it, it's using its technologies to to learn and, and to, you know, to, to really be putting out the best information out there. But not even so much. We can look at in the technologies and the CRMs that we're using and, you know, how we're lead scoring and how, how, how this technology is really helping us as business owners make better decisions. Um, you know, I, I think right now it's, uh, it is the future and, you know, I, I think we just need, really need to be on the lookout and be capitalizing on, you know, some of these softwares and platforms that are really integrating high levels of machine learning and AI. And I think it's, uh, it is going to be the future in business for sure. Very cool. Um, so let's kind of. And I see we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, When we talk about, okay, we've produced awesome content. We really know what we're talking about because we're an industry expert. We get all the stuff that needs to be part of the quality guidelines. You and I both don't have to be told, and I suspect a lot of folks that are listening to this also are are of the mindset that, you know, social is important. The the thing that I oftentimes will tell our clients is, people don't necessarily want to bank with a bank. They want to bank with a banker. They want to get to know you as the individual. They want to make sure that you can be trusted. If they have a question, they're going to come to you. And whether you're in banking or any other industry, the social arena is really where that individual kind of connection and relationship building can take place and and whether you need to spend your time in LinkedIn because it's professional or in Instagram because you're creative or in Facebook because you're more B2C and you know the the mm-hmm. network I don't think is as big of a of an issue in this as much as the sense that leveraging all of that awesome content and using the social media platforms as the bullhorn to get the rest of the world to know about it and to be able to have that one-on-one connection and to be able to get with you directly. Um, maybe talk about the the implications of social as it relates to distributing that content as the brand and as individuals that work for the brand, the people that are behind it, that are part of the business. 
No, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I think you uh, you brought in some good points here. Well, on, on the social side, one of the big things that we, we did focus on the book uh, in the chapter, sorry, is that, you know, we're not, all, you know, social platforms are more than just places where we can publish content and syndicate content and go out and get our information. But I think we need to look at the flip side of social media and also understand that, you know, social platforms are now an area where, you know, your end users, where your clients, where your potential clients are going in to, you know, really validate at this point. You know, they're going in to see uh, what people are saying about you. They're going in to see what your company culture is like. Uh, they're, they're going in to really dissect all kinds of information that are personal. And, and I think it's exactly what you said. You know, we don't want to bank with a bank. We want to bank with a banker, for example. You know, and if I am going to go invest my money with a, you know, banker, there's a good chance that I may go to a place like, you know, LinkedIn or Facebook uh, to see what others are saying about said person uh, in order for me to help make a better decision. So I think, you know, when you really look at it this way, um, you can see the massive implications that social media can have and some of the reasons why you just want to be fantastic at it. And you really want to ensure that your brand is positioned properly on social media. And more importantly, that you actually have uh, a presence on social media. And I think at this day and age, I don't think you can be a business or a brand without really having something on social media that is really going to uh, help you stand out. And again, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of noise in social and, you know, everybody's doing it. And we really need to do something a little bit different. But I, I, I really look at it as not so much what am I doing right now in terms of social? You know, yes, we need to be putting out content. We need to be uh, engaging with our end users who are out there. But again, more than anything, I use social as a search engine. I'm always looking at what people are saying about people to ensure that I'm making the right decisions. Absolutely. And I think that's the that's one of the key things that you've said. I mean, you've said a lot of key stuff, but using social as a search engine, we usually think of it as networking or the place we go to watch cats chasing laser pointers or whatnot. Um, but, you know, if you have a service, a lot of people will go to Facebook and, you know, they won't use the engine to look in Facebook. They'll even use their friends and their connections as the search engine. So they'll post and say, um, you know, I did it myself a couple of summers ago. I went to Facebook, right. we needed our deck power washed and stained. Mm -hmm. I didn't have time to do it. Who would you recommend? I didn't go to Google and ask. I didn't type it into the general search to look for who was optimized for power washing and deck staining. Mm -hmm. I went to my network of friends, my personal Google and asked them. And so as we think about this whole nother social network driven search environment you know you talked about reputation and reviews but what are some of the other things beyond content and trustworthiness that businesses and people within the businesses should be doing in order to influence that algorithm because that's not controlled by google that's controlled by your relationships with all these real people and what they say about you no, and, and absolutely. But, you know, I, I, I truly do believe that, um, you know, obviously I think, you know, as SEOs, we, we know social signals are part of the algorithm. But, you know, I, oh, I sure. do think, you know, I do think Google looks at it in a sense where, you know, it's, you know, we're looking, you know, Google came right out and said, listen, we're looking at what users are saying, user generated content, right? We're, we want to know what people are saying about your brand, about you on other sites out there and other sites will include social media sites at the end of the day um but I, I i truly do believe as a brand you know one of the one of the big things that people really want to see is culture um and, and i love the way that you said it eric you know again we don't want to bank with a bank we want to bank with a banker so if i'm a bank you know i'm going to make darn sure that there's a great culture on social media about my brand we want to see the people inside these four walls Right. We, we want to see how, you know, they're interacting with the end user, what they're doing, who they are, what they're about. And, and I really do believe that is the power of social media and brands really need to take social seriously and do a phenomenal job at positioning the company culture as something that wants to draw people in and that people find attractive. And I, I really do feel that is the true power of social. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, uh, 
making a note to myself. I just had inspiration for a blog post about uh, the, the concept of a people-powered search engine and the algorithm being the humans that are influenced not by what a program says, but what you're actually doing. So who knows? Maybe that might show up on our brand new website that is coming to a computer screen and mobile device near you very shortly. <laughs> so Beautiful. cool. Well, Beautiful. anything to wrap up? I know I think you had one final slide with like some culminating. So we've, we've dropped a ton of information. Is there a, sure. like, if you're going to get started, at least these two or three things to pay attention to, do a better job of, commit to trying to implement in 2020. Um, what would you say? Yeah, you know, and I think it's right here on my closing slide. You know, I, I think first off is, is listen, um, for the most part, we all know this right now, you know, Google's moved to a mobile first indexing. I don't think that's something that most people don't know at this point. So be creating mobile friendly content. Just just make sure that everything that you do today, you do for mobile first and ensure that when you're doing that, you're just answering questions. Always be answering questions. I think, you know, again, stop writing just random content. Ensure that you're, you know, you have a question and that you're answering that question. Um, anticipate the growth of voice searches. Um, and I think this is, you know, again, we're, one thing that we're actually doing right now in our reporting with our clients is we have some of our team members actually sitting down beside a Google Home and recording, you know, questions to see if our clients are actually coming up. And we're, we're actually recording this, you know, letting Google say, you know, we found three locations near you and here, are, you know, oh, there's our client. So, you know, really anticipate the growth of voice. Um, ensure that, again, you're answering questions clearly, concisely. Um, recognize that social media platforms are search engines. They are leading search engines. They're not replacing Google. Uh, they're not going to replace Google anytime soon, but people are searching uh, in social media to find out about your company culture, again, to ask for recommendations, to see what people are saying about you. So as you said earlier, you know, it, it is, it is about being great business. And if, you know, and if you are a good business person, you're running a clean business, then these things should happen naturally. But, you know, we do need to be ensured that, you know, a lot of these, uh, you know, these reviews and, you know, this information and what people are saying about you, that it is positive and it is out there in social media. And, uh, you know, we didn't really touch on too much about uh, social influencers here today. We just didn't have time. Uh, but understand that uh, really there's a lot of people within your neighborhoods. There's a lot of people within your cities that can greatly influence your brand. Uh, so don't be afraid to reach out to these ones and uh, see if there's any ways that they can help promote what you're selling. Absolutely. Well, the the value of a connection in the social environment, you know, clout, I, I don't know as if that's even honestly around anymore, but the concept <laughs> of how active are you on social media, how connected are you with other folks, sometimes you can go and see how many people they have connected to them on LinkedIn or how many followers they have on Twitter. Um, but being able to identify that level of engagement, we talk with our clients about understanding the economic value of a customer and how much new business is worth. And that goes into the ROI and a new customer, how much a lead is worth, but figuring out what the return on engagement potential is, if you can get someone engaged and they retweet your information or they share it or they comment on it, when that happens, at least from the social activity that we're seeing, and I'm sure it's the same for you, you can very easily tell when something gets picked up by an influencer and they chime in on the conversation or they share it with their network or they participate, which exposes it to their connections. Mm -hmm. Um and there's a certain amount of nuance to that because you don't want to make those folks feel like you're using them just for their connections, but understanding what makes them tick and being able to build genuine relationships with those folks so that there's a, there's a symbiotic give and take, and they will help you amplify those messages, which will ultimately go back and benefit from a search perspective. So like you said, we didn't have a ton of influence or conversation today, but um, that's another big, big element that, uh, I think is really important. And that also, I think ties back into the whole eat, you know, expertise, authority and trustworthiness Absolutely. element as well. So cool. 
Absolutely. That's well, this great. has been an absolute joy. I could talk for another hour on this stuff, and I'm sure you could too. Um, for folks that are interested in getting connected with you, um, maybe wanting to follow you, LinkedIn, connect, What what's the best way to, to find Mark and to stay engaged with you? Yeah, you can definitely find me on LinkedIn. Uh, very active there. Just uh, search Mark Jameson. I, I should be one of the first ones that come up. Uh, you can follow us on uh, on Facebook at WSIE Strategies, and uh, same uh, same thing on Twitter at WSIE Strategies. Uh, just go ahead and search it and follow our page. Awesome, cool. I uh, just took a quick peek, and I see I got four minutes, so I'm going to squeeze as much juice out of this as I can. Let's do it. Um, there's uh, there's one comment. So, um, uh, hard to rank on page one for trades, lawyers, restaurants, for example. We need to work with clients to help get on their listings that display their businesses, lawyers, uh, ADDO.com, lawyer.com. Sure. What about some of those, like, micro sites that are more directory related um those might come up but then you're listed on those sites mm -hmm. you want to get any thoughts on that actually coming up on on directories is that what you're talking about sorry you may have to... yeah i think so yeah so yeah. like avo and lawyer.com so you may not necessarily take the number one spot mm -hmm. in google but if someone is going to lawyer.com and doing a review for lawyers is it is it good or almost as important or maybe in some industries being even more important to focus awesome. on ranking well in those little micro chasms because maybe that's where people are going to find a lawyer not to google but to lawyer.com or to bankrate.com or to webmd you know those sorts sure. of places yeah you know i i think just like uh you know most of these directories you know they have uh you know, if I look at some of the ones that we're even listed in, you know, it's, you know, obviously it is very different than Google's algorithm, but they, they have certain things that they want in order for you to climb up the ranks. Some of these times they can be reviews, depending on how much information is that you need to put in there. Just ensure that you're optimizing, you know, based on what the criteria for that directory is um, and what time you should be able to climb up. But, you know, a lot of times when it comes to these directories, the ones that are at the top are paying for it. Yep. Cool. Good. Yeah. And uh, take into consideration too, you know, I know you mentioned legal, um, you know, and that does fall within the uh, your money, your life kind of uh, category as well. So, uh, oh, absolutely. You know, so read the guidelines. They're, uh, Google's taking it uh, very seriously. And, you know, if you're in legal, medical, you know, if you're in financial, uh, you're going to have to step it up a notch. There's no sense what's about it. And thanks to our mutual good friend, Peter, I've been told that the guide is 168 pages. Well, I said 160. So now, I was close. I was close. There you were go. close. But I, I told him in the chat that I would be sure to publicly correct you on his behalf. So there you go, Peter. That one's for you, buddy. <laughs> so, I was going on Peter to, uh, yes. Yeah. All right. I love it. Absolutely. So. Anyway, like I said, this has been a blast. I certainly appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to to share your expertise. Uh, really enjoyed your chapter. Um, I get questions from folks a lot about the book. I know we did a soft internal release at our annual convention in 2019 at the end. Um, we're making a couple of tweaks and it will be released out to Amazon here, I believe within the first quarter. Um, so keep an eye on it and uh, stay tuned to free webinar Wednesdays. We've got several more chapters to go through and um, just again, really appreciate you uh, sharing your insight with us, Mark. And um, thanks everybody for the questions and great engagement. So that, uh, that wraps today's show. Hop out to freewebinarwednesdays.com to catch some of the others and stay tuned for future episodes. Until then, have a great week, and uh, we'll see you back online at freewebinarwednesdays.com. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Cheers.